Hello and welcome to this, our second Kaleidoscope webinar as part of our Collaboration Know-How series. Um, hope you were able to join us yesterday for our first, uh, where we had international insights on clinical collaboration with people from as far um, afield as Cincinnati and um, Melbourne. Uh, we're now coming back to basics. We're doing London and Birmingham. We're coming back to a home turf in this discussion, which is all about some of the, the practical realities around collaboration and partnerships uh, and how uh, successful partnerships can best be fostered uh, in the real world amidst all the pressures and challenges we are all facing. Uh, so my name is Richard Taunt. Uh, I work here at Kaleidoscope and I'll be the facilitator for today uh, and really pleased to welcome a, a fantastic panel. Um, we talk a lot about what we do at Kaleidoscope about trying to bring together different tribes and it's great that we've got um, representative from academia, Robin, welcome, joining us from Birmingham. Thank you, thank you, Richard. Uh, uh, Tim from Think Tank Land, uh, from the Health Foundation, thanks for joining us. And finally, uh, Lucy from Management Consultancy World. Um, so thank you all three for joining. Uh, I think we're going to have a great discussion. Many thanks to all those who have uh, signed up to join us. So a few preliminaries before we get going. So just to remind you, so we are Classic. Uh, we're a social enterprise set up to bring people together to improve health and care. And particularly at the moment, we're thinking about provider collaboration. How can providers working across the NHS uh, most successfully come together? And we've been particularly thinking within that about not just the models which people may want to consider, uh, but also some of those practical uh, tips, strategies, tactics, to best make that collaboration work for patients and populations. Uh, so this is the second of our two webinars. Uh, we have a face-to-face -face event next week. Uh, looking forward to seeing you there if you are joining us. Uh, if you're, if you just stumbled across this, and what on earth is all of this stuff, uh, do go on the website and find out more. Anna, I've realised I didn't introduce you, that's very bad. Anna, no thank you very much for joining. That's quite all right. <laughs> Um, so just three ways to contribute today. Uh, so we're not going to bring people in um, uh, verbally, just because of the number of people on the line. Uh, so instead what you can do is you can use the ask question feature to send in comments, questions, uh, observations. And as we're not going to go around and do uh, introductions to people who have dialed in, if you just want to put who you are, where you're from, uh, in the sort of in the chat box there, uh, as, a, as a little question, send it off and just so we can get a bit of a sense of who's here, that would be great. So that's the first way to join. Second way uh, is just to email us, uh, admin at clydescope.healthcare, uh, if that's an easier way to uh, do come in that way. Or finally, uh, if you'd much rather just use Twitter, uh, please do, our hashtag is NHS Know How, uh, or our um, Clydescope Twitter handle is at kscopehealth. Um, we are recording the session today, uh, so if for some reason your Wi-Fi suddenly breaks halfway through, don't worry, uh, this discussion will be available online to watch back later. Um, and the slides, we'll both put those uh, on the website, but also if you go onto the little handouts bit, which you should be able to see on your sort of GoToWebinar dashboard control panel thing, uh, you should be able to, to download those now as well. Um, if you want to sort of scrutinize as we go through. But come on, don't skip to the end. There's sort of a, there's presentations to get to. Uh, so thank you again for joining. We hope that you'll be able to join in the discussion as we go through. So the running order for today uh, is we're going to start off uh, with uh, Robin and Tim talking about their work, and then pass to Lucy, uh, and then we'll probably have about half an hour or so for questions and discussions. So at any point, do put in questions, observations, as we go through. Anna, what have I forgotten? I think that's everything. That's I think right? we're good to go. Yeah. Good to go. Excellent. Good. Well, without further ado, um, I think, um, Tim, you're just going to kick us off in terms of uh, the piece of work, where it came from, and what its focus is and was. Okay, so thank you, Richard. Um, my name is Tim Gardner. I'm a senior fellow at the Health Foundation. Um, so I, I think this is, you know, Richard built this as, 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 as the work that Robin and I have done. Um, I did the glamorous bit of, of arranging for it to be paid for. Um, Robin actually did a lot of the hard work with one of his colleagues, Ross Miller. It's a very valuable role, that pay for. Uh, oh, it's hugely yes. valuable, yeah. hugely valuable. Um, so before Robin gets into some of the meat of, of what the work was and, and what it found, um, I'm basically here to talk a little bit about why we commissioned it. Um, so there's a really long history of uh, providers in the NHS collaborating with one another, um, but there were uh, 
in around late 2014, I think it was, when we were first thinking about this piece of work, um, there were a number of fairly recent developments in national policy which had really put it under the spotlight. So the first of those were the uh, changes that were made and the introduction of the new special measures regime that was brought in in the wake of the Francis inquiry into Stafford Hospital. And one of the novel components of that was that providers who were put into special measures had to be buddied up with, with a high performing neighbouring trust with the idea that that buddy would help the struggling organisation to provide some support. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, uh, the uh, NHS Five Year Forward View and Sir David Dalton's uh, review of um, new options for NHS providers, of which I was involved when I was at the Department of Health, um, had both endorsed collaboration as a way of pushing forward the, the quality frontier and improving what the NHS can do for its patients. Um, so very high hopes, I think, across the spectrum there. Um, but some quite bold assumptions. Um, uh, some of you may well have been in the NHS for long enough to remember Sir Ian Carruthers' memorable phrase that you don't necessarily get an eagle by strapping together two turkeys. Um, but that, there was a lot of um, very optimistic talk um, about benefits of increasing scale, um, the ease of transferring good practice from organisations who were deemed high performing to organisations who were, were deemed to be struggling um, and, and, and perhaps some underestimates of the sheer amount of resources required to do, do collaboration well. Uh, and at the same time there was just a big gap in the evidence base on what happens when people try to collaborate, what makes things work, what gets in the way and causes problems. And so that, for that reason, we started talking to Robin and, and, and his colleagues to, to think about undertaking a bit of research about how partners collaborate, ways they collaborate, how they collaborate, and what results from that. Um, and at that point, I think it's over to Robin to actually talk about the important stuff. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tim and Richard. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Robin Miller. I'm a senior fellow at the Health Service Management Centre at the University of Birmingham. Um, and as already presented, I undertook this research with a colleague, Dr. Ross Miller, who would love to be here today, but he's finishing off a book on Chinese health reform. So there we go. So um, Richard, do you want to move forward a slide? Would that be all right? Okay, so what we were looking at in our research project was um, organisational uh, partnering. So between organizations that were either merging or acquiring another organization, and this idea of buddying. So a more um, individually based, sometimes informal, sometimes formal arrangement whereby key individuals in two or more organizations would be connected up as a way of improving quality. And in the research project, we were particularly interested in quality. So clearly we recognize that financial efficiency, uh, doing things at scale are really important potential uh, benefits of undertaking partnering work, but what we were particularly focused on was the quality and implications of that. And the research had three main components. The first was we spoke to a number of national stakeholders uh, connected with the NHS. So both those who are running trusts, people in policy development, regulators, CQC, monitor, etc. But what they thought were the current issues in partnering uh, that were going to happen now in the next four to five years. We undertook an evidence review um, uh, of what the previous literature was and studies that have been completed. And then we undertook some more detailed work in five case studies um, of current NHS partnering examples. And I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about what those examples were. So Richard, could you go forward a slide, please? Fantastic. So what was the, the evidence that was there already? So there has been some studies of organizational mergers and acquisitions in general, and some of those have been uh, undertaken in the healthcare setting, largely in America, but with some notable examples in the UK as well. 
Um, and what the, the literature shows us today is this, is that the, there's often a, often a high aspiration of economic efficiency through particularly merging or acquiring organizations. The idea, the notion that by sharing backroom functions, by consolidating some of the estates that we have, that will therefore lead to a, a more effective use of resources. Um, and the evidence suggests that these were actually rarely achieved in practice, um, despite the fact that they were common aspirations that we've maintained over many years. Years. And in relation to quality, what we found well, from the literature was that whilst there were sometimes examples of elements of quality being improved, there was actually as many examples of quality being affected or being reduced by some of these organizational partnering arrangements. So despite our aspirations, that wasn't actually played out um, in the evidence. We also found from the literature that the, 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 the transactional cost of undertaking these organizational mergers uh, was often um, uh, unanticipated in its size and complexity. So people did recognize it was a task, but they didn't always recognize how much resource, how much time, how much energy, how much distraction that would be caused by undertaking uh, these mergers. In relation to the more individual-based um, work, there was two, two clear things in literature. One was to do with buddying, which is often connected with people starting in a new place of work and being connected with a more experienced member of staff to learn the ropes. Uh, or peer mentoring, uh, in which people were going to undertake a new responsibility um, or were seen perhaps as not being that competent in their job and they were for connected with a, another hand that was, that was uh, more experienced and uh, perhaps understood how to do it better. And the evidence that was there suggested that if done well, those did have significant benefits, both in terms of people's self-esteem and their confidence and their ability to undertake the work. So what we found from the overall literature review was some studies have been done, both areas are not currently as researched as we could, and there seemed to be risks and benefits from undertaking such partnering. So we then went and spoke to people working in the NHS. And do you want to go forward to the slide, Richard? That'd be great. Okay, so we talked to this wide range of national stakeholders. Um, and what they sold us was the, the following things. First was that partnering and collaboration has always been an element of NHS provision. Uh, we clearly see that through uh, integrated care and trying to work better with social care and trying to work better with the voluntary sector, etc. But in terms of NHS organizations themselves, again, collaboration and partnering is something that has been um, in place for some time and is likely to be for the foreseeable future. As Tim talked about, we've got responses to special measures, we've got the five-year forward view, we've got sustainability and transformation plans, all of which are emphasizing the potential benefits of partnering between organizations. Mm. But people said, again, uh, reflecting what literature was, that while we see this as being something good, there's often a lack of clarity about what it is we actually want to achieve from partnering. And we often start on the NHS with a problem. We say we've got an issue here of uh, one trust is, is not so strong, one trust is stronger. We say perhaps we're not as effectively joined up as we could be. We've got a fragmentation in a pathway. And therefore, we jump to solution. And what we seem to be doing currently is jumping to organizational partnerships as being a solution. And people are saying we're not always as clear as we should be about um, what those uh, implications are. We talked to people who worked in private healthcare settings as well, so that was important. And what they reflected was interesting that they said that often the NHS partnering comes about as a response to a problem, uh, whereas in the private sector, often it's to try and develop a new opportunity. So it's saying, here's an opportunity to develop a new service, to access new resources. How do we get the right partners around the table to enable us to grow and to improve what we're doing? So it's a very different slant to more of a, a negative problem slant. They also said that where there are um, examples of buddies being in place, so we've got a stronger organization supporting an organization that was, was struggling with quality, it put real pressure on the stronger organization. And again, this idea of not being clear about what would be required and the diversion from normal activity was not always recognized. And finally, in terms of the informal arrangements and the individual arrangements, there's often an unequal access. So depending if people have got a particular background in terms of medical school, in terms of gender, sometimes all the way back to, to, to what um, uh, school they went to, then that can sometimes give unequal access uh, to, to, to networks to improve their own practice and those of their services. So do you want to go forward to slide, Richard? So what we decided to do was to try and look at five different case studies. We developed the typology in classic academic style. Um, and on the uh, x-axis, on the horizontal, we've got a continuum between voluntary partnering, so where organizations have chosen to work together, 
and mandated partnering, where often the regulator has said, actually, you need to work together because we're worried about quality. On the y-axis, so on the vertical, well, at the top, we've got more individual arrangements, so thinking about connection between key people. And at the bottom, um, we have more of a structural arrangement. And we chose five case studies that reflected these quadrants. So on the top left, we have case study A, which was to do with a, a voluntary arrangement where the respiratory um, teams within two different trusts had got together to try and improve home ventilation services. Um, in the top quadrant, in case study B, we were looking at um, a mandated buddying where a stronger trust was providing key leadership and key clinical support for a trust that was um, struggling more with quality. In the bottom right hand corner we have the acquisition of a failing trust by a stronger trust and then the bottom left hand corner we have two examples. One was a contractual agreement between uh, a national specialist NHS trust and cancer services and a private sector diagnostic firm and also a voluntary merger between two NHS trusts. We went out, we spent time with the people on the board, senior clinicians, etc. And we also had a case study um, a service area where we spent time speaking to the frontline staff, the doctors, the nurses, the receptionists, the technicians, etc., to find out what their experiences were. So what I'll do now is give a couple of slides which are highlight the main findings and clearly there's a lot more to share which we can bring out during the course of the next uh, hour or so. So Richard, would you like to go forward? Uh, then? So the first thing we found was that in terms of these different types of partnering, so the individual or the structural, um, each type had its potential benefits. So there were, there were opportunities there to improve the quality the patient received, but equally not, none of these were easily gained or sustained, whether it was in a low, a, a low level or in a large structural level, these were more complicated than people anticipate in practice. So therefore on that basis, what we said was that partnering can be beneficial, but you've got to enter into it cautiously. And one of the main factors that will enable the partnering to, to deliver the, the, the promises is the environment in which it's playing out. Are commissioners supportive of these partnering arrangements? Are there new resources available? Crucially in the mandated elements, are the regulators going to give the partnering the space and the opportunity to achieve the benefits? In one of our case studies, the Care Quality Commission were still very much involved, requiring a lot of reporting, um, a lot of assurance that it was going to make a difference. And that was seen as a real distraction from the budgeting happening uh, in practice. Whereas in the structural example, there was almost like a, a year's um, holiday given from the regulator. So yes, they did have occasional meetings, they wanted some assurance, but they gave them space to develop and to improve and to build on the partnering, um, which was much, uh, which was very beneficial. And finally, this idea of an overly optimistic view about the gains um, and the resources and time scale required is not only naive but actually is potentially harmful because it is such a distracting activity because it can take away people from their current jobs it can actually damage rather than improve quality unless we do that very cautiously. Do you want to go forward to slide Richard? Thanks. Okay so what we need to do partnering well is we need to do a clear focus, make sure there's an achievable opportunity and a sustained commitment and in many ways that is not different to probably what we'd have said 10 or 20 years but that doesn't take away from the fact that we still haven't necessarily heard that lesson in the NHS currently and we need to be very cautious about being overly optimistic to what it can improve. We need the sophisticated understanding about what sort of partnering arrangements would, would work well. So for example in the acquisition which actually did go quite well they started off with more of a budding arrangement where they got key people to spend time in the other trust to find out what was going on to understand the scale of the challenge and then to move forward onto the more formal arrangement. Similarly in the arrangement between the cancer um, specialist centre and the diagnostic centre, they started small. They started with some small projects that were quite discreet and worked up from there as they understood they could work together and they could trust each other's organisations. There's something about understanding the variation, the spectrum, understanding the implications and building up towards those. It doesn't have to be a voluntary activity and much of the literature, much of the thinking about partnering or collaboration says it works much better if people come from it on the basis of their choosing to do that. They're much more likely to give their enthusiasm, their commitment, but actually what we found was that where there are people being told to work together, that can also be effective. But you need to think through how that's being done and make sure there's the right support and the reality around it. Similarly, competition, again, often seen as being um, the opposite, the nemesis of collaboration. That's not what we found. What we found was that when 
competition is promoting the opportunity for good collaboration between organizations, it can add it can act as an incentive and a resource provider for collaboration then to happen in practice. So it doesn't say competition is always good, because clearly it's not, but sometimes it can be if it's done well. And finally, again, often controversial in the NHS, the case study we looked at of private sector partnering was seen to be beneficial by all parties. Um, and we spoke to a lot of clinicians who were saying, I came into this thinking, this private sector partner, we're just not going to get on with them. We're not going to have the same values, the same aspirations. But actually, that's not what they found. What they found was there was a similar commitment to patient quality. They could see how the private sector provider brought in diagnostic equipment, could invest up front in terms of the capital the NHS just wouldn't be able to find, and were able to collaborate and respond with them um, appropriately. So again, it's not saying private sector is always a good partner, but it can be in practice if it's done well in the right environment. So to summarize, what we find is this, is that different forms of partnering do have potential benefits. We need a greater sophistication, a greater skill set within NHS managers, leaders, and clinicians in understanding what's the right partnering for the right environment, and we do need a structure around that. Even in small-scale partnering, we need a process. We need to understand what we're trying to do, to gather in the data, to analyze, and to respond to. And if we do that, then there are real um, benefits to be had. And I think I'll stop there. Robin, thank you very much indeed. Very, uh, very succinctly put as well. And uh, end, ending on a bombshell, Robin, in terms of you're saying that not all private sector firms are evil. Is that right? Is that a key point? I am, I am definitely saying that, Richard. I'm definitely saying that. Sure. I can imagine the Daily Mail front page tomorrow, Robin. I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. Uh, Robin, thank you very much. Uh, Tim, anything, anything final to, to add? Excellent. No, that's very exciting. Well, we'll move. We'll move quickly on. Um, uh, sorry, last thing, Robin. And um, you're you're going to be publishing a paper on this, uh, which will be available in the next next few weeks. I understand. Yeah, that's right. So it's just going off to the design company currently. So it should be available in the next four weeks. We think. I think end of end of June, beginning of July, uh, it will be ready and able to download through the University of Birmingham website and hopefully with some uh, links to the Health Foundation one as well. Perfect. Great. We'll make sure that everyone on the on the course day is uh, is sent those links when it's through. Robin, thank you very much. So moving swiftly on, Lucy, welcome. Thank, thank you for joining us. Um, hi everybody. Uh, do you want to just flick to the first slide, Richard? Um, so just a brief introduction to Credo for those people who uh, might not have come across us. So we are a strategy consultancy firm. We specialize in a small number of sectors, um, one of which is health and social care, where we work across both public and private sector providers. Um, our experience that's relevant here is that over the last two years, we've been working fairly extensively with three of the four um, Vanguard organizations who are um, pursuing group models or, or chains, as, as people might more commonly refer to them. Um, so we've worked with those organizations to um, define and articulate their vision in terms of what does the end state look like and what are the near-term stages towards that end state, to understand and model the benefits of that approach, and then to design the organizational model that will ultimately deliver the vision. Um, and importantly, as we worked with those organizations, we found that each organization got to a different answer. Um, and that's because they're all, they all have different local circumstances, they're in a different environment in terms of the providers that surround them, and they face different challenges and opportunities. Um, and all of those different considerations impact what model is right for that organization and for that region. Um, and as the Dalton Review quite rightly highlighted, there really is no one-size-fits-all when it comes to uh, considering partnerships and, and collaborations across providers. So part of the support that Credo provided to the NHS vanguards was to um, look at the learnings that could be derived from, uh, we looked at UK uh, hospital chains in the private sector and how they worked. We looked at international uh, hospital chains, and we also looked at um, groups outside of sector, um, and we were pleasantly surprised how many learnings were actually transferable from those types of organizations. Um, and by working across the three vanguards, we learned a lot about groups. So we learned a lot about the process that an organization may go through to decide whether it's the right approach for them, what questions they need to address, um, and what models we could leverage or learn from as we went through that process. And in the spirit of the Vanguard program, which is all about sharing and proving 
um, replicability, we're looking to share some of that knowledge that we've gained uh, in the form of a paper. Um, so the name of the paper is is on the slides, um, and it will be sent to everybody who's who's on this webinar. Um, the release date is is next Tuesday, so we'll make sure everybody gets gets a copy. Um, and the purpose of that is really just to raise awareness of this type of model and to support some of the providers who may be considering whether this might be the right approach for them. Um, so I just want to take uh, uh, a minute to ask why collaboration, or more relevant to my experience, why group models. So I think everybody will be familiar with the list of challenges outlined on the left-hand side of the slide, um, but of course these are in no way exhaustive. Um, it's clear that providers are going to have to deliver more for less uh, with rising demand and an increasingly constrained funding environment, and that's going to take a different approach. Um, there's wide-scale variation. I think everybody acknowledges that as an issue within the NHS, and that's not just between providers, but it's also within providers, and that's reflected in their clinical practices, the culture, and then ultimately reflected in the patient outcomes that they achieve. Um, and what we often find is that providers are working in competition, so they're working in competition for resources, uh, such as workforce, they're working in competition for capital, and they're even working in competition for patients in many cases. Um, and I, I agree with what Robin said about that sometimes that can be positive, but in some cases that also creates misaligned incentives and it creates organizational silos. One example of those organizational silos um, is that sometimes organizations feel compelled to focus on what's the benefit to our institution of this and what's the benefit um, to our bottom line over and above thinking about what's the benefit to the system and what's the benefit to, uh, to patients, uh, which plays out in a culture of winning and losing organizations that we so often see uh, as a hindrance to service reconfiguration. And many providers fundamentally don't have the critical mass that's required to invest in resources, assets, and intellect that you need to drive improvements. Um, so when you look at US hospital chains and the investment that they have made in digital analytics, that's a good example of where, quite frankly, it's unaffordable for individual hospitals, particularly small district general hospitals, to invest in those types of capabilities at small scale. So in terms of the, the system response to this, so it's clear that, clear that the direction of travel is increasingly focused on collaboration rather than competition, and that there's growing interest in not only groups, but accountable care organizations and accountable care systems, and that leading providers are being encouraged to be part of the solution for organizations that are structurally unsustainable. And I think the incentives for those organizations to play that role are partly altruistic, so to play their part, um, but partly an acknowledgement that system stability is to the benefit of everybody. Just okay. So for anybody um, on the webinar who's thinking, so what do we actually mean by, uh, by a group or by a chain? The simple answer to that is that there's a myriad of different organizational forms that um, are defined within this term. So from wholly owned subsidiaries, which is probably what most people jump to when they think of what a group or a chain is, but also uh, it can encompass different organizations coming together to collaborate in a formal way under the terms of a memorandum of understanding. And in terms of a group structure, what we commonly see is organizations coming together pooling strategic leadership into some form of central uh, group function, sometimes called a HQ. And the purpose of that central function is really to provide three, three four things, sorry. Um, so the first is to provide strategic direction across all of the organizations, and that enables them to make more informed decisions about the benefit to the system and the benefits to the patient rather than individual institutions. Um, secondly, the group center is often setting a common operating model, which allows us to address variation and standardize practices and processes. Um, thirdly, uh, they play an important role in talent management and leadership, um, and then they often deliver some enabling services, so be that consolidated back office or clinical support services. 
So then what we see around that group centre is uh, the really important stuff, which is where care is delivered. So a number of operating units or member organisations and their role really is local strategy and local engagement. So they're the they're delivering safe and effective services day in, day out. They're driving improvements, they're delivering change, and they're managing patient flow through the hospitals. Um, and I keep saying the word hospital, but actually it's important to acknowledge that these types of arrangements um, can be applied to non-acute environments. Um, so uh, vertical provider collaborations, again with the ACO, ACS type models. And they can also be relevant for large multi-site trusts who are trying to think about how they can better manage span of control within their existing organization. So in terms of, of the benefits that this approach, or in fact, uh, many forms of collaboration can deliver, um, we've outlined six on this slide, but I'm gonna just pull out two in the interests of time. Um, so the first one uh, around reducing unwarranted variation. Um, so many people on the webinar will, will know that identifying and then addressing unwarranted variation is really, really difficult. Um, and it's worth saying that the group in, it, in and of itself is not a panacea for, for being able to do that. But what it does do is it gives you the scale such that you can get access to the necessary expertise. It allows you to develop a robust evidence base on which to develop your uh, standard approach and it gives you the scale to invest in the analytics that you need to do that. Um, and smaller organizations would really struggle to replicate that. So one organization that we looked, uh, looked at a lot as we worked with the different NHS vanguards was Intermountain in Utah. And their approach to addressing unwarranted variation is both impressive, but if you translate it to an NHS environment, uh, it's unaffordable really for individual hospitals to be able to replicate such a model. Uh, the second benefit that I'm going to pull out is um, uh, the ability for uh, groups to pool and share scarce resources across organizations. So what we often see today is separate organizations each investing in resources and duplicating and not necessarily making the best use of those resources. Um, as a group, organizations are able to pool those resources um, uh, around talent and capital, um, uh, all of which are scarce in today's world, and deploy them more effectively, which will both um, return the, uh, increase the return on investment for the NHS and also drive additional quality benefits. So this is, is the last slide, uh, really thinking about the exam question which was um, what are the practical steps that providers might want to take if they're considering such collaborations. So the right hand side of this slide is an extract from the paper that we've pulled together mm. and it's really a process that we're recommending providers follow that really embeds the principle of function before form. So really making sure that you're clear on what outcomes you're trying to achieve before you dive into the development of the model. And the risk is that unless providers do that, they're just really rearranging deck chairs and not focused on the delivery of the benefits for patients and um, for the cost effectiveness of the system. Then a couple of specific points that I thought were worth pulling out in terms of a recommended approach. Um, so first is for organizations to really understand their baseline. So understand um, where their strengths are, where their weaknesses are, and where their opportunities and challenges are. And uh, within that, to really understand their local environment and their local context, because as I said at the start, that will really impact what the most appropriate model is. And as we worked with the three vanguards, um, it was both expected, but we were also pleased to see that those nuances played out in, in, in terms of uh, the different models that they developed. The second point I would make is um, for organizations to think carefully about the trade-off or the balance of doing upfront diligence and preparation work versus the power of learning by doing. So this is something that I think the Raw Free team in particular is very thoughtful about um, uh, in terms of whether we should spend more time polishing a theoretical model versus implementing a model that might be 80% of the way there with the express intention of saying that we're going to learn, we're going to iterate and we're going to develop this as we go. 
Lucy. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, an excellent run through. I was I was secretly hoping there'd be some massive discrepancy between your work <laughs> and Robin and Tim's work, so we could then just spend 25 minutes of just arguing. Uh, but a huge amount of commonality there, so really, really good to see. Um, and Lucy, thank you. Uh, just uh, I've, I've got to throw one question in, if that's okay, and then it'd be great to get people's sort of views and uh, feedback um, on on the text. Uh, but you you were, you were talking about those practical steps for for providers. Um, Lucy, and uh, just a bit of an unfair question for all three of you. Um, you're you're in a lift with a chief exec of a trust who's just announced that they're going to do a big uh, partnership with the, the trust down the road. You have 30 seconds to impart one piece of advice about how their partnership is most likely going to be successful. So you're in a lift with a chief exec, just about to start a new collaboration. You've got 30 seconds to impart one piece of advice. Um, we'll start with Tim, then go Lucy, then Robin, if that's okay. But just right. to remind people, whilst people frantically try and think what their one piece of advice is, uh, the three ways you can interact with us today are either put in questions using the question function, uh, send us an email, admin at clivescope.healthcare, or tweet using the hashtag NHS Know How uh, or our Twitter handle at Ascope Health, uh, and we'll bring your comments in. And hopefully that's enough filler so I can now turn to Tim and say, your one piece of practical advice. 30 seconds, in a lift, off you go. Uh, my one piece of practical advice, um, what you get out will depend on what you put in. You might get back less than you put in, but you won't get back any more than you put in. And fundamentally, this sort of collaboration is all about trust and reciprocity. And the lift tools open, off you go. Excellent, Tim, thank you very much. <laughs> Lucy, you can't um, just say what he said, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> not. Um, so I think the, the piece of advice that I would give is to think carefully about how you make sure that the collaboration goes further than um, relationships at the top of the shop. Mm -hmm. So often when we see very successful collaborations, they're underpinned by key individuals having very good relationships with their counterpart and the other organization. And typically, although not always, they tend to be kind of board level people. Um, and I think one thing that's really important in getting sustainable collaboration is making sure that that relationship kind of t transcends and goes, cascades down into the organization. Excellent. Thank you very much. And Robin, you get the hardest gig. No, that's okay. I think, um, I think I'll have more time. I think data. So none of the case studies we looked at really had sufficient data to say this is what life mm. was like before we started partnering, this is what life's like during the partnering, that's going to be like at the end. And you, you just got to have the data. And it is complicated in the data, it's difficult, but you do need data. And on top of the data, you need a process to think about it. So if it's at a, a massive organizational level, that's a different beast. But even on the front line where you've got two services partnering together, you need a process, whether it's plan, do, study, act, or whether it's another kind of methodology, to regularly come together to say what's happened as we expected, what's going differently, how can we improve it? So I think data and improvement process is absolutely key. Excellent, and congratulations to all three of you coming up with something different, <laughs> and I hope you weren't just get, ah, they just stole mine. Um, so please do put in comments, questions, observations, and we'll, we'll come to those. But just, just, just one reflection I had, listen to all three of you uh, talk about the topic, is that if, if you are landing from Mars, I'm really sorry, I go from lifts to landing from Mars. If you're landing from Mars, you might be a bit confused that you look at the evidence base, Robin, as you were saying, and you see that actually there's not a, a huge amount there in terms of positive evidence base about uh, sitting behind provider collaborations. Yet it just seems so intrinsically sort of the right thing to do, to join up and to share and to learn. So, so I'd be really interested in all of your views about why haven't we got it right before and how optimistic are you about, about the future? And let, let's turn the order around. So do you want to go Robin and Lucy then, Tim? Sure. I mean, I th the first thing I'd say is that, the, I mean, evidence is, bases are usually limited uh, and a lot of it comes down to what money is there for research, how complex uh, an intervention are we talking about? And when we're thinking about organizations coming together and the whole sort of different set of dynamics that play into that and the contextual factors, it's not an easy um, aspect of organizational life to actually study. So the fact the evidence base isn't super strong 
doesn't necessarily mean um, it's not a it's not a good thing to do. So I mean that's that's the first thing I'd say. Um, the second thing is again I, I think it does play into that idea of it. it genuinely feels like a good thing to do. We think collaboration is a positive venture in general. Um, but we just need to be more sophisticated than that. We need to challenge some of our assumptions. To say sometimes working collaboration is wasteful, neglectful, distracts some of the priorities, and not feel bad about saying that. I do a lot of work around um, interprofessional working on the front line, um, and people, the bit people find really difficult is challenging bad practice in others, or saying actually I think going to that MDT is not a good use of my time because I'm never saying anything. It's much better if I go and see more people in my clinic or do more home visits. But that's a difficult thing to say because it goes against the grain of us generally feeling that collaboration is a good thing and those who do not collaborate are bad people. So it's, it's a combination of those two things. The evidence base it, it's never going to be as full as we'd want it to be, but also it goes against that common um, logic and kind of uh, sense of, of collegiality that we have. But we have to be willing and brave enough to say that. And equally, when there is an opportunity, is to grab it, to do it well, to put into place some of the things that Anna was saying, and try and take that forward. Uh, Robin, thank you very much. I almost thought you were going to do all academics out of a job there in terms of just dismissing this research evidence base. But well done, you, you, you pulled it back admirably. Thank you, uh, Lucy. Um, so I would agree with, with Rob, what Robin said, that we shouldn't get too hung up on, on the evidence. Um, I think there are clear and sound reasons why collaboration is a good thing, and we should, we should focus on those and use the evidence where we can. I think um, it, it's difficult to um, overemphasize how challenging it can be for leaders of these organizations to give the time um, and the dedication to this type of approach. So we're currently in a situation where leaders are constantly being torn between the imperative to deliver against short-term targets around financial sustainability and A&E targets mm -hmm. versus focusing on delivering the long-term transformation um, that is ultimately going to make the whole provider sector sustainable. And I think those difficulties can often be um, a distraction and a factor for uh, for partnerships or collaborations not working. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of how we make them work, I think it's um, often around putting the right incentives and the right framework in place. So I think lots of the systems, particularly when you're thinking about vertical collaboration, uh, lots of the incentives in place today don't work. And we see that time and time again with the link up between health and social care and other aspects. Um, so really we need to focus on um, giving organisations the imperative to collaborate, giving them the time and the headspace to be able to focus mm -hmm. on it, and then making sure the incentives are in place for them to, uh, to deliver. Excellent, thanks. Um, well, I completely agree with, with what's, what's been said. Well, um, some disagreement. Come yeah, on. well, there we go. Um, <laughs> or, or, or possibly for slightly different reasons. Um, I mean, Fundamentally, collaboration is, is, is what has got us as a species to where we are today, um, just to, to take the longer term view. Um, <laughs> but, you know, doing, doing the right thing is, is not always the same as doing the easy thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, as, as Robin points out, sometimes these, these things are very complex interventions that can be quite hard to really understand and even harder to evaluate. Um, a lot of this stuff is, you know, it's a bit like that, the, the well-worn quote about second marriages, they're the triumph of hope over experience, but, you know, surely we want hope to triumph over experience. Um, to sort of bring it down to a slightly more grounded level, I think one of the things that quite often holds these things back is we tend to focus a lot on organisational structure. Mm. So we talk about the structure charts, um, we obsess about what, you know, the, drawing the, the fine detail on the PowerPoint slide, um, and I, you know, I'm, sure, I'm sure we've all done it, and it's important because you know, organisations need a structure. But actually, they also, we, we, we tend to focus on structure at the expense of wider configuration. Mm. And what I mean by organisational configuration is it's the set of relationships, the flow of information mm. that actually help make that structure to work. And, and quite often, structures work, uh, organisations work despite their structure. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they work because of it. Um, but actually, there are other things that we need to look at beyond just the structure chart. Um, and, and that's, I think, if we focus on the structure chart, quite often this is why these things fail. 
Um, Tim, thank you. I, when, when I said at the, the top of the top of the webinar that we were going back to basics, I didn't quite imagine going back to sort of our basics as a species. But um, nicely, nicely brought in, Tim. Thank you. Richard, yeah, just so just to follow on what, what Tim was saying. So one of, one of one of the things, one of the lessons from evidence that we often find is this idea of, of not just being focused on on structure, but also thinking about culture. Um, and yeah. one of the case studies we worked with was the acquisition. They did pick up on that lesson from evidence, and they spent a lot of time trying to assess the cultures of the two organisations, trying to think through how do we get the best out of these two organisational cultures when we come together as single a single entity. Um, and I think that's quite a good example of, yes, the, the evidence may not be as robust as we'd like to be, but there are clear lessons there. And we've picked up in terms of what Lucy was saying and I was saying today as well. So there are indications there that organisations can then pick up upon when they're trying to do partnering well. Um, Robin, thank you. And actually, you, you, you stole the, the question from my lips. Well, I, was, I was going to say, uh, Tim, you had mentioned before your, in, in your sort of one piece of, piece of advice, um, thinking about trust, mm -hmm. reciprocity. Um, and we're, we're, we're trying this webinar to think about sort of some quite practical sort of ways and advice you can best support collaboration. One of the, the issues we've struggled with here at, at Kaleidoscope is that when you say that relationships and trust are the issue, what does that mean in terms of what you then do from from your work, both in this role and other roles? Have you seen sort of practical strategies where trust really have trust or others really try to focus on trust and what actually some of the things they did to do that? Um, so I, I, I think I, I'd hark back to what Robin was just talking about. So the, the the case study, which I think is case study C, in in the the the, the report on partnering for improvement, was very much one where there was a lot of attention paid to some of what generally referred to as the softer aspect. So how do we bring these two organizations together and make them into a cohesive whole? Um, and I think it's it, that, that particular case study is a really excellent example of how yeah. that was done very deliberately, led from the top, and made into a, a, a hugely important centerpiece. I mean, do correct me if you think I'm wrong, Robin, of, of that particular um, transaction. Yeah. So rather than just thinking about what what are the what's the, 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 the rational strategy? What's the structure chart? What what deck chairs are we going to move around? Mm -hmm. Those things are important. They need to be done as well. But there was a very strong focus on how do we, you know, what are the values in this in this partner? What are the values in that partner? How do we bring these two mm -hmm. things together? Excellent, Lucy. Anything you want to add from your from your work? Um, no, I so I, so I think more of the same. So the organisations that we've worked with have thought very carefully about if we are creating a group that ultimately is scalable, i.e. other organisations can choose to join, so we've talked a lot about this being a coalition of the willing, um, what type of characteristics would we expect mm -hmm. those trusts to demonstrate in order for us to have the trust that we would take them? Because it, that has to work both ways. So that organisation has to feel um, able and willing to join, and you have to feel able and willing to accept them to join. Um, and often it does come back to the behaviour set, mm -hmm. to the cultures and the value of the organisation. Um, and we've always um, uh, recommended that organisations make sure that that is at a clinical level and not just mm -hmm. at a uh, senior leader's level. So there needs to be close alignment of um, colleagues in uh, the similar services across the organisation such that when you're trying to um, really get into the nitty gritty of how you're going to improve services, so kind of redesigning pathways and things, there's a cohesion and there's a similar way of working. Great, thank you. And, uh, and uh, insert plug here. If you're interested in hearing more about clinical collaboration, I think you're going to catch up on yesterday's webinar. Uh, and I think there's some really interesting sort of shared international insights on that um, uh, as well. So please do have a look at that. And um, Robin, just just to come back to to yep. you, this sort of uh, you made this lovely point that we sort of we often don't spend long enough in sort of the, in the problem space in the NHS. We go, ah, great. Uh, here's a solution. Let's let's just grab it. From the from the examples sort of you were looking at as part of the work, and um, if if collaboration is is the solution, what what do you see as the principal problem it's trying to solve? There's of course lots of different facets to this, but is there one particular area um, which springs to mind, which you would see collaboration as the the principal way to to solve that particular issue? 
I don't. I don't think. I don't think there is, Richard. I don't think there's one one particular issue. When you look at some of the benefits that the organisations get from collaborating, and we we look particularly in our study in in acute settings. Um, again, building on what Lucy said, there was opportunities there in terms of perhaps consolidating services in a single site, so we've got expertise. There was opportunities in terms of sharing some of the background resources. There was opportunities in terms of recruiting easier, because actually people saw it as a, as a larger organization with more diversity of opportunity for career development, et cetera. So I don't, I don't, think, you can, I don't think you can say that there's one, one particular um, benefit from collaboration. Um, so no, I'm going to say I don't know the answer to that question, Richard, and I, I don't think it's a fair question to ask. So, so basically, you're saying my hopelessly reductionist approach is wrong. Yeah, in a nutshell, yes. Excellent. Good. We've got a disagreement. I love it. Thank you, Robin. Um, Thank Anna, you. how are we doing? Have we got questions coming through? We do. Um, got one from Rob. Thank you very much. Um, the question is: Some of the group models in other countries cover huge geographies, mm. and if relationships and culture are really important, how should we think about providing collaborations within and beyond local health economies in England? Excellent. Uh, great question. Uh, Rob, who would like to kick us off? Okay. Yeah, please. Um, so during our work, we looked at lots of the international chains, and that's absolutely right. Mm. Some of them are huge. Um, and I guess one just watch out is that many of these organizations are private sector organizations whose ultimate goal is, is to make profit. Mm. So you have to ask yourself, what's the benefit in them growing bigger beyond a local health economy? Is it scale for um, the benefit of scale or is there some advantage that they're able to deliver to patients on the ground through uh, through having that wider geographic reach um, and I think it's a mixture of the two so when we looked at the benefits in uh, very specific detail there are some benefits that can only be delivered through providers working together around a local health economy economy so um, uh, streamlining pathways, reconfiguration of services, clinicians working together, all of those uh, those things. But there are also some things which are transferable um, across geographies, so different ways of working, um, uh, transferable methodologies or content-based things, the sharing of um, IT systems or, or digital well. enablers. Um, so there are definitely benefits to be gained through greater scale and collaboration across geographies, but there are also the greatest benefits to be had within a local area and the providers um, working together. What you often find when you look at international groups is that there is a regional layer, and that's because the regional layer is really important in terms of making those decisions about how do we best provide services for a given population. So, uh, so in Germany, for example, um, uh, organizations there will have a central HQ function and then they will have regional teams who are trying to answer those questions before you get to the individual hospital level. Lisa, thank you. Uh, Tim, international examples are an area you've looked at for as well. Um, they are, they are. So I, I, I went and looked at a number of those when I was working with David Dalton during his review. Um, I mean, I my experience was was pretty much identical. So, uh, as Lucy pointed out, a number of these these organisations do have a regional layer. Um, I, they, they might call them regions. They might call them support hubs. SHAs? Um, no. No, okay. no, not quite. Not quite. <laughs> um, that that actually help do that at a more localised level. Um, working across contexts, working you know, across different cultures, it, it can be quite tricky. I think a lot of it, as Lucy says, comes back to articulation of the benefits that you expect to get from scale. So when we were doing the Dalton Review, one of the working assumptions that we started off with that um, fell away somewhat as we went through the process was that all chains have some sort of standardized operating model which they push out on absolutely every single site for every single service. And a lot of the feedback that we had from the international change was that they, they don't do that at, at quite the scale you would expect them to because it's, it takes a long time and it's, it's really hard. Um, but they do see people as being as buying into um, certainly the vision and also the benefits that they get from, from working together at scale. Uh, I think there's, a, there is, there's certainly at least one German chain where the chain effectively sells itself to potential new new partners on it on the basis of its values and its benefits, mm -hmm. and it doesn't take people over unless they buy into those. And if they're not aligned with it, then mm -hmm. it, the, the 
the transaction doesn't happen. Tim, thank you. Um, time is time is starting to be against us. Uh, Robin, any any quick in, uh, insights on the value of learning from international uh, comparisons? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe not about international samples, but but just I think Ben asked a really good question. And again, when we think about collaboration, whether it's between organisations or individuals, we often come down to this idea: if you get people, have people who get on, who trust each other, it's much easier. And that's great where you have that, but in so many places we just do not have that at all. Um, so there's something as well I think about the, the skills of collaboration um, and we know that there's certain ways of engaging others, of being clearer as Tim said in terms of the outcomes, also being able to challenge each other, the meaning we can, we can get a collaboration up and going much quicker than if we don't understand what those skills and expertise are. So I think there's something about the, the individual practice of managers, leaders, clinicians that we can embed much more strongly that would enable us to, to get off from, from a cold star into something much more positive. Robert, that sounds like an excellent sequel to your report. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know anybody who'd be interested in funding such a piece of work, Tim. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, Robert, I really like the point. Thank you. Well, as I said, uh, we've only got a few minutes left. Yeah. And so actually, just, just before we close, it'd actually be lovely if it's okay with the three of you, if we could just go around and hopefully people on the line have, have, learnt, uh, have learnt a lot from the school. I certainly have. So it'd be great to get some two of you. Is there just one particular thing uh, which you've learnt from this? Cool. So if we go back to our original order, so if we go Tim, then Robin, and then Lucy, and then we'll close. Tim, one, one thing you've learned from the previous 56 minutes. Uh, one thing I've learned, um, oh, um, I've, I've learned quite a lot. Um, I, I wasn't aware of the piece of work that Lucy's been doing, so I will look at that um, when it comes out next week with, with, very, with huge amounts of interest. Excellent. Good. Uh, Robin. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I thought I thought Lucy's presentation was excellent. I thought the infographic really summarised quite a lot of information in a very succinct format. And I think I really like these kind of the different models of of group organisations as different ways of typology and thinking about it. So I think I'll be going back and reading that report in some detail as well. Excellent, Lucy. Um, yeah, so to, to iterate these guys, I thought it was all really interesting. I think there were. Sorry to break the rules, but three things that, that re <laughs> resonated with me. And, That's and one for each of us. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, the, so the first was how the NHS often articulates challenges rather than opportunities. Um, oh. I would agree with that from what I've seen, but I think we might be starting to see a change in that, that language set. So mm. lots of the people we've been working with are talking about challenges of sustainability, but they're also talking about the opportunity you know, around analytics mm. and around digital and around scale and those types of things. So I'm hoping to see a change there. The second thing that resonated was um, making sure that you have whole system support for these types of collaborations. Mm. So you can't have provider collaborations without regulatory support and commission support. Um, and then the third thing, just for my private sector colleagues, um, is that um, I was really pleased to see um, you highlight the benefit of private sector um, collaboration. Uh, we work with a number of private sector organisations and I think there is a lot that the NHS could learn from and there's also access to capital and other things that we could be very savvy about leveraging um, and would have seen some great collaborations between the two, of course. Um, uh, that's not to say they're not evil. <laughs> not all evil. Not all yeah, we've, evil. We've, we've got that confirmed by an academic, yeah. which means that it's, it's true. Um, uh, uh, Lucy, Tim, Robin, thank you very much indeed. We are, we are out of time. Um, thank you also for everyone who's joined. Hope you found it a useful uh, last hour. Just three quick things from me, which first that the, you'll be able to watch this whole webinar again. Uh, on the website, it will be up there from tomorrow morning, along with the slides. So if you have colleagues you think would um, uh, would benefit from, uh, from catching up, please do share with them. They'll be available to all, so please share that. Um, if you're coming along to our face-to-face our -face day next Tuesday, Tim, Lisa, you're both coming. Robin, you're coming. Excellent. Anna, you're coming. Oh, great. <laughs> Uh, I'm coming. Uh, yes, I am. Yeah. Uh, if you come along to Face to Face Day, it'd be great to see you then. Very much looking forward to seeing you. And we'll be carrying a lot of these, uh, the challenges which we've been discussing today, into to that day. Uh, it is now fully sold out. So if you if you haven't got your ticket, I think there is a waiting list, uh, so you can join, or else find someone else who's got a ticket and just sort of steal it when you're when they're not looking. Uh, no, that's not the collaborative solution. Uh, join the waiting list. But I hope to see you. Hope to see you there. Uh, and finally, to end on the 
the sophistication of there will be an evaluation form which we'll be sending around uh, as uh, people have noticed and pointed out on other occasions without data it is very hard to improve uh, so be very grateful if you were to fill that in uh, so I will end there and say thank you once again Robin and Birmingham thank you for joining thank us you. thanks for the opportunity okay. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Thank you. Thanks all for joining, uh, and we hope to see you either next week uh, on a future Cloudscope webinar. Thanks so much. Goodbye. Bye, all.